Hello and welcome to Brooks TV. I'm Sherwin Zi. And I'm Huma Gori. Coming up in this week's episode... Could when you are born affect if you get into Oxford? Under staffers' orders, celebrities turned out again to support a local charity in Oxford. Calendars say spring has sprung, but the weather proves otherwise. Many feel getting far in life has been down to talent and hard work, but could it be down to chance? Is the real reason due to when you are born? Recent Oxbridge figures could show that your birthday affects your achievements in life. Anushka Dige has this report on the matter. According to recent studies, the birth date effect could explain why some people are more likely to be accepted to Oxbridge universities. The figures showed that those born in the autumn months could be more likely to be offered a place at these top universities. Evidence from Cambridge assessment has shown that children born later in the academic year perform, on average, at a lower level. With Oxford releasing figures on issues about gender and ethnicity, the BBC took it into their own hands to gain birth date figures for the 2012 admissions. We went to speak to the university's admissions officer, but they refused on multiple occasions to speak on camera to Brooks TV, but they did give this statement. There is no evidence that month of birth directly affects an applicant's chances of getting into Oxford. If you look at the real predictor of success getting into Oxford, which is the success rates of those applying, then you see that students born in January and August are most successful at winning places to Oxford. While those born in September have the lowest success rates at winning offers, so it's just not true that what time of year you are born in determines whether you will get into Oxford. Brooks TV decided to investigate to see if there was a higher concentration of students born in the autumn months studying at Oxford. After asking 50 students, the results did not show that there was a significant amount of autumn birthdays. In fact, it was the lowest percentage. The 2009 study by Cambridge Assessment was overseen by Tim Oates. In the foreword, it calls the birth date effect a very serious issue and suggests that summer borns are less likely to get into university. We spoke to him to see whether he feels this problem has been tackled and improved. All of that work suggests that there's a strong impact, or a strong, rather a strong effect, um, in the early years of education. And it, it, it then appears to taper as children get older. So it's an important issue when you're young, but by the time you get to A-levels, it's no longer really important. Um, the summer borns who do go to university do quite well because um, you know they've overcome all the natural disadvantage associated with being younger in their year group. The study by Cambridge Assessment does also suggest that the birth date effect is most pronounced during infant and primary school pupils, particularly in sport. With evidence on both sides of the debate, it's up to you to make your own opinion, but the Cambridge Assessment study does state that there is no evidence that when you are born has an effect on the outcome of your degree. So it's time to knuckle down and study hard. This is Anushka Dige for Brooks TV. I never thought as be when, I was be when I was born being a concern for sport. Well, in today's show, as you will soon find out, has a sporting theme running through it. And running is exactly what was happening recently when a huge number of people were on hand to raise money, including some famous faces. Anushka Dige heads down to find out why the OX5 run takes place every year. A soggy March Sunday morning at Blenheim Palace was a setting for the annual OX5 run, which was in its 11th year. The run, which raises money for children's hospitals around Oxfordshire, has become a permanent fixture in the calendar for many. Nearly a thousand runners competed this year from over 50 teams with the goal to raise more than the £60,000 achieved last year. We chatted to Sarah Vakari, the event organiser, to ask how the event started. This is the 11th year we've had the Oxford Mail Ox 5 run um, and we think this is the biggest number of people who have ever taken part so we're absolutely thrilled. It's kind of grown year on year. At the beginning we were focusing on raising funds to actually build the children's hospital and now we've got it, we're trying to keep it one, you know, one of the best places that children can be treated in the UK. 
The race is heavily supported by many famous faces, with David Cameron promoting the event after running in 2009. Raymond Blanc, the Michelin-starred chef who resides in the county, was once again on hand to help start the race off. We spoke to him about why the event is so important to take part in. I've supported it for the last three years actively. Before I used to support it from the warmth of my house. Now I'm on the field, yet I don't run. I start things, I let them run. I most feel happy that so many people are giving their private time okay, to come today in a freezing morning, okay, on, the, on their Sunday, on their day off, and run for the cause. Okay? That shows a community spirit. The key side to the race is where the money is being spent, with a large portion helping out at the John Radcliffe Hospital in Marston, where there is a large paediatric ward to help children through whatever illnesses affect them. Okay. Whilst at the run, we spoke to Jay J. Mohan, a paediatric neurosurgeon at John Radcliffe, who was also on the BBC Two show Brain Doctors, about how the money has helped the hospital and why it's important to keep the event going children when they're in hospital so it's going to be things like TVs, playstations, comfy areas, a nice bit where they can be not a patient they can be a child when they're in hospital. The sensory room which is an area that kids can go into and just relax and be completely out of the hospital environment for a bit. It may not be their medical treatment but it makes their hospital stay just a little bit more pleasant and a little bit more bearable. People run for all sorts of reasons so we found out some of the stories behind the people running. Uh, I'm doing the run today because my daughter Betsy um, had an operation at the Oxford Children's Hospital last year and they provided brilliant care and they do for everybody. My daughters have been treated at the Children's Hospital and the care they've received has been absolutely fantastic so um, we're doing it for them. Both my nieces have been in and out of hospital. One of them was born with clicky hips, hole in the heart thing, and then the other one was born nine weeks premature so she's been in and out of hospital as well. Let's hope the run can raise even more money than before and that it grows in years to come. This money will help more children to have a fighting chance and cross the finish line to recovery. Anushka Dige for Brooks TV. How pleasing to see families come together like that. <sighs> last week saw the first days of spring. Temperatures this time last year hit 20 degrees Celsius. But the unconventional weather for this time of year could mean a white Easter for Oxfordshire. Callum Mitchum took a look at how the weekend's freak weather affected us. The arrival of spring is usually the start of new life, but this weekend that was not the case as the beginning of the season was put on hold as snow had fallen again round Oxfordshire. This should have been the setting for what should have been a fierce derby between the Brooks, Thurston and Fourth. The weather has affected many sporting events throughout the weekend such as the World Poo Sticks Championships in Little Whittenham. It is not just sports that have been affected, but many local businesses which are feeling the effect of the weather. Independent shops around Oxford have had a slow weekend for customers, so we headed over to the historic covered market in Oxford city centre to ask some of the shop owners to see how the snow has affected trade for them. It's, it's been a bit quieter today. I mean, <clears throat> some of the older people aren't going to come out in this weather anyway, are they? Because it's sort of the dangerous aspect of slipping over. I mean. If I was at home, I'd be not. I would want to stay in the warm anyway. I'm a florist in the covered market at the Garden Oxford. Um, we're only affected um, with the snow through deliveries if they're really bad. Um, that tends to be um, just a slower delivery time or maybe delivery the next day. Many of the effects will still be unseen for a while to come. Oxfordshire Rose suffered heavily with potholes over the recent months, in particular London Road in Headington, and these are bound to get worse. The water that is produced after the snow melts will cause problems for the drains in the coming weeks and with flood warnings already out around Oxfordshire, more chaos could be on its way. Let's hope the sun can spring up in time for the Easter holidays. This is Callum Mitchum for Brooks TV. I hope the weather clears up soon for next weekend's fixtures. <laughs> next up, disability sport has risen in the public attention since the Paralympic Games in 2012. Ox um, Anushka Dige has the report on money being spent in disability area in this in disability sports in the area. The events of London 2012. The games were a landmark moment for disabled sports, with the coverage of the Paralympic Games and the remarkable success of Team GB showcased to the whole world. There has been an increase in interest in disability sports, but has there been an increase in funding for these sports? And I would say that hasn't changed that much since the Paralympics. I mean, there's more interest, but there's not much more money available. 
Last month, the County Council's Chill Out Fund, which provides money for young people, handed a grant to the Oxrad Centre. This money has been used to provide archery sessions at the centre. Despite being busy in Mallorca with his training camp, we spoke on Skype to the five-time Paralympic champion Jody Cundy about the rise on funding and how young people need to get involved. Disability sports are kind of this new awareness really after the London Paralympics. It's always been underfunded and the increasing numbers of people that want to do sport and increasing funding is kind of essential to, to make sure that you give every opportunity to everybody who wants to, to do something within the sport. If you're in a situation where you're not able to, to play sports and stuff because you're disability, to have clubs and centres that are arranging disability specific sessions, I mean it's an amazing thing. When visiting the Oxrad Centre we had a look at another sport that gained publicity in the games, boccia. The sport is very similar to bowls but can enable those in a wheelchair to play both independently and with support. The Marston Bay Centre enables people with disabilities to take part in sports. People have become a lot more aware of what they can do since the Olympics. Like We had um, a lot of disabled people come in that we haven't had before and they didn't know that these services were available. Alistair Oddie is someone who frequently uses the centre. He told us why he thought the Paralympics were so important for him. I thought it was really good because I'm in a wheelchair and they're not alone. There's not a lot of sports that are for disabled, accessible people. I definitely am going to try different kind of sports in a kind of different kind of way. Butcher is already raising interest in both the Oxrad and the disabled community. Let's hope that it continues to grow in popularity and that there are more sports like it to come. This is Anushka Dige for Brooks TV. Do remember, if you have any stories, don't hesitate to get in touch by our email, brookstv at brooks.ac.uk. You can also tweet us at our Twitter account, brookstv. That's it for this half, but still to come. Has a new sport jumped into Oxfordshire? Is women's sport still rowing against the tide, or are they head-to-head -head with the men? We are joined by Oxfordshire Disability Sports Officer James Craggs to discuss funding of disability sport in the county. Hi James. Hi. Um, right, so how can more money be brought in to disabled sports? Um, we've got lots of ways uh, really of funding coming in. Um, like I say, uh, one of our main funders as a, a county sports partnership is Sport England. Mm. So that, that's how we get funding. Um, also for our various other partners, um, disability organisations, if they would like a particular activity happening, um, that funding can come in up for us and we can help to mm. organise and, and co coordinate things really. I see. Well, um, Sport England has invested £2.6 million pounds into um, disability sports, but um, has Oxfordshire seen any of that? Come into use. Um, unfortunately, in the in the last round of funding, it's getting very competitive in terms of lots of areas want to get into dis disability sport. So mm. unfortunately, we weren't successful in that um, funding round, but we've been well sourced in the past and we've had mm. funding, so that's been able to to keep going. And um, we've also had funding through various things like county council and um, aiming high fund for children with disabilities so we've just had £10,000 through that so we have lots of other sources as well. I see and how has that funding been spent? Um, in terms of the um, county council funding we're, we've got a, a project called uh, Wheels for All which is a disability sp uh, cycling project for uh, young people so it's to get adaptive equipment, adaptive bikes so that's one of the, the things that we've been used for. I see. Um, and how can more money be raised? Um, like I say, it's through um, partner contributions. As a, a county sports partnership, we have numerous um, partners ha helping to provide for us. So, so that's one of the main ways, really. I see. And what about like the people? Can they do anything to raise the money as well? Yeah, in, in terms of like our wills for all sessions, um, people charge for those. So we have charge three pounds a session so that makes it sustainable and people have a lot of ownership from it because they're contributing so they want to come and mm. be active. Cool. Um, well um, there are places like Oxrad in Oxford and um, 
will there be more places like that popping up if you guys get enough funding? Yeah, in terms of that, um, obviously uh, Oxrad is a, specifically a disability sport club, but obviously we work with mainstream clubs who have inclusive sessions. So for people with uh, non-disabled and disabled people and other clubs that have, you know, um, particular disability sections. So, yeah, there's lots of opportunities to set new things up and to build what is um, really successful at the moment. I see. And um, Jodie Cundy, a five times Olymp Paralympic champion, um, took part in able-bodied sports. Um, has there been a rise in disabled youths taking part in able-bodied sports? Um, yeah, I would say that um, through the, our school games competition, which is a national um, competition for young people that it's, it's really I'm helped very, with. I'm very, very sorry. I'm going to have to wrap it up because that's all we've got time for. But thank you very much. Uh, well, more money is being spent on young people in Farringdon, but on a very different type of running. Parkour, the sport made famous in films like James Bond, is hitting the streets of town. Maya Lakani jumps down to find out more on the story. I'm here in Farringdon, where a local community project has plans to turn an old disused building into a centre for the extreme sport called parkour. Let's see what this sport is all about. Parkour, more commonly known as free running, has grown in notoriety over the years since the sport came to attention after the first online videos in the late 90s. The sport itself sets out trying to get from one place to another, which often means jumping from wall to wall and a large amount of gymnastic talent. But now, the sport will have a new home in Oxfordshire, with a disused theatre in Farringdon being turned into a parkour centre, with tutorials and trainings being set up. Other facilities for youths include an editing suite for youth projects and a cafe run by those interested in catering. We spoke to the organiser of the parkour project, Lou Smith, to find out how the interest began. In the local area, the school, which has been really interested in getting involved with this because they actually run from year seven, so when the children first go up to the academy, they are actually doing a parkour six-week course. So that's really where the kids actually kind of grasped the idea that there was this sport that was more inclusive and quite exciting. The usual area of practice by this group is a supermarket car park, which compromises theirs and other safety which means this new centre is all the more important for users to train in a safer environment. The facility is expected to be opened in May after raising £19,000 to begin the project with £2,000 coming from Lord Farringdon. We asked Olivia Bloomfield, Head of Fundraising, about how the money was raised. Well, the total cost of the project is £26,700 plus VAT. So we decided at the outset the easiest way of raising it would be to ask 30 people to give us £1,000 each and we've had some success with that strategy. The old Pump House Theatre was last open in 1994, nearly 20 years ago. We asked David Price at Farringdon Town Council why it has taken this long for the building to be reused before it goes into disrepair. The council has got a number of buildings and uh, it's just really the requirements for the local residents and the need. Um, the theatre sort of fell into, into sort of disrepair I guess uh, because there wasn't a need for it. It was an old cinema and, and a theatre so what I would like to do is uh, get that back together. Um, we don't have the finances to do that at the moment and we anticipated it'll be sort of two to four years before we have that so we've had an, we've come up with, a, with an agreement with parkour group here to use the building in the interim period we asked for the views from the young people who will use the facility and what it means to them the fact that it's here you know it'd be like a lot to me and a lot of friends that we can actually go somewhere and practice safely and not having to risk it would just give me a place to go and practice what I do at home and actually put it into an actual environment and get something out of it that can be taken away by everyone and enjoyed. Well it's time to run for me and I wonder how many will jump at the chance to have a go at parkour. This is Maya Lakani for Brooks TV. Well I sure would love to have a go at that. <laughs> you never know, it may catch up, on, catch up on the Olympics one day. Moving away from sport for a moment as we take a look at some of the other recent stories in the area. This month, the Cowley Mini Plant celebrated its 100th birthday. Production started in the plant in 1913 when William Morris started to build Morris cars. The company was taken over in 1994, but they retained the factory. Production at the Mini Plant in Cowley still continues today, 
where around 900 cars are made daily, with it still employing around 3,700 people. The now infamous Harlem Shake has caused upset at St Hilda's College, Oxford. It has led to the sacking of a librarian after she allowed students to record the video in St Hilda's in, in the college library. Students have also been fined for their participation. The junior common room has started a petition to have her reinstated. The college has refused to speak to the press on the matter. Thames Valley Police have started a crackdown on drugs in the area with Operation Bilbo. February saw warrants enforced around the area. Hawthorne Avenue was the largest seizure. Gordon Killey, leading the team, said, I hope this sends out the message to the community that we are conducting far more warrants than those before to catch those involved in drug dealing. Police have urged those with information to ring the police's non-emergency number 101. As March comes to an end, third year students can finally relax as they hand in their dissertations. With an estimated 4,500 students all fighting to get to the finish line, the queues for printing were a potential problem for students at Oxford Brooks. With some students waiting for multiple hours, the frustration was in, was in continuous increase as the deadline loomed. We spoke to students about the queues and printing services. Well, about two hours, I would say. Very frustrating at first because I couldn't see the queue uh, until I go inside and then when I was inside it's like actually that is quite a lot of people. Nothing you can do about it really because there's just so many people getting it bound. It's just get it in as early as possible. Uh, I'm going to get a GoPro printed tomorrow. Uh, hopefully it'll take about 20 minutes. Disability is just one way that can affect your sporting life and along with the report earlier on how birth months could affect your success. Could it be that gender is still another factor in sport? Anushka DJ heads down to Dorney Lake to take part in women's boat race between Oxford and Cambridge. The boat race between Oxford and Cambridge is known about nationally with shots of the Thames being broadcast live on TV. However, how many people have actually heard or know about the female equivalent that takes place a week before? We spoke to people around Oxford to see how many knew about the race. I haven't heard anything about it before. This is the, um, I guess, the first time that I've heard of it. I haven't heard anything about it, to be honest with you. Nothing, not really my scene, but still haven't heard anything. I think the men's is far more sort of promoted than the women's, uh, which is a shame, actually. The female race was started in 1927, but was not made a permanent fixture until the 1960s. The opposition from male counterparts meant that the race was moved to Henley in the mid-1970s. The Henley boat races are a well-known regatta, but the fact that the women's varsity fixture is still not held in the same regard as the men's race is an ongoing issue that affects more than just competitive rowing in the world of sport. To understand the differences between male and female rowers, we spoke to former coach Ben Reid. No, I don't think gender is a matter of it. People have got to remember that the men's lightweight crews also race at Henley. The other thing is it costs a lot of money to run an event on the Tideway and up till now the women haven't had that. Advertisers feel that the female sport doesn't bring in enough money and because of a lack of available funds there is little advertising. The women's varsity boat race however is taking a positive step and will be moved to London in 2015 to coincide with the men's race. This is a growing trend that has also recently been popular with female cricket and rugby teams. It is done in the hope that the publicity of women in sport will inevitably grow once it is relocated in London in two years' time. Four races took place this Sunday. The women's, the lightweight men's and women's, and the women's reserves. The conditions at Dorney Lake this year were far from perfect, but all competing teams dealt well with the windy and bitter weather. At first, Cambridge seemed to be the stronger side in both the women's and women's lightweight races, but after the first stretch of water, Oxford came into their own and pulled ahead. All Oxford teams set a high standard throughout and took home wins in all four races, with the women's lightweights winning by four and a quarter lengths and the Newton women's winning by an impressive six lengths. Oxford were most certainly today's champions, but the bigger champion will be women's sports in years to come. This is Anushka Dige for Brooks TV News. Well, that's all we have time for this week, so we look forward to seeing you again. For now, though, it's goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. Goodbye. goodbye. Oh, my God.